Whether you agree or disagree with the logic of the first three Crusades, it's hard to argue against the fact that they basically did what they set out to do, or at least died trying. In all three cases, men gathered and pledged to fight to spread Christianity by arms, went to the Middle East, fought, and then lived with the results. Well, the Fourth Crusade decided to break with tradition. Um, and while I have subtitled this video a series of unfortunate events, I think that this might be underestimating the malice of certain figures like the Doge of Venice. But what I'll probably do is just kind of present the events as they happened and let you judge for yourself what the motives of these people may have been. I don't claim to know. And there's been so much controversy surrounding this event and the years since that, uh, you know, the truth is a little bit cloudy at best. So, let's talk about the Fourth Crusade. So, the failure of the Second Crusade had really dulled the appetite of Westerners for embarking on huge expeditions to the Middle East. But, when Jerusalem fell in 1187, they got a renewed sense of urgency and the Third Crusade was launched under such luminaries as Richard the Lionheart, Philip II Augustus, and Frederick Barbarossa, three very famous and powerful medieval rulers. Um, but that crusade hadn't quite done what it set out to do. Now, Richard won quite a few battles and took some towns on the coast, but ultimately he was unable to take Jerusalem. So, many Christians who regarded Jerusalem as the center of the universe and certainly the center of their religion were, you know, thinking that this is something that needed to be redressed. Um, they were helped along in this thought process when Saladin died in 1193, and then his empire fell apart and split in two. His unified power had been what had really held back the Crusaders during the Third Crusade. So now that he's gone, um, there's an opening. We see that the crusading zeal hadn't died out because in 1197, Louis the Six or Henry the Sixth—I don't know why I keep saying Louis. It's Henry the Sixth of the Holy Roman Empire tried to avenge his father, Frederick Barbarossa but he died before he could really do anything. But it does show that there were still people willing to sign up for these crusades. And we get a new pope in 1198, Innocent III, and his main thing when he comes into office is that he wants more crusades and he wants to finish what the Third Crusade started and retake Jerusalem. Um, the problem for him is that all of the other monarchs in Europe have other pressing matters. Um, England and France are fighting each other. This is the aftermath of Richard and Philip not being friends uh, anymore. Um, and the Holy Roman Empire at this point is trying to separate itself politically from the papacy so they don't want to do what the Pope tells them because anytime you do anything the Pope requests, he then claims that in the future as a right and a precedent. Um, so... The ultimate goal of any uh, of all the Westerners who are crusade-minded is to reclaim Jerusalem. The question is, well, how do we go about that? We've tried a direct assault on Jerusalem in the Third Crusade. That failed. We also tried a, you know, a reclamation campaign in the Second Crusade, and that also failed. So we need to think a little more creatively. What are we going to do? If we revisit the history of the Third Crusade, you'll remember that during the course of the Third Crusade, Richard I, the Lionheart, and the other leaders of the Crusade were at loggerheads over the direction to take strategically. Most of the leaders wanted to march straight on Jerusalem while Saladin's power was broken, but Richard proposed going to Egypt to attack his power base and then depriving him of the ability to ever harass Jerusalem again. Um, and ultimately Richard had thrown a tantrum and refused to allow an attack on Jerusalem and uh, you know that's how things went but because Richard was generally regarded as the most successful crusader and he was you know basically a living legend by this point at least um, for people who hadn't had to deal with him personally and had come to hate him uh, his strategic advice was regarded as valid so basically the new idea will be to attack Egypt and then from Egypt, you, you will cut off any potential reinforcements that could save Jerusalem. Um, now, again, the monarchs of Europe are not currently interested. They're doing other stuff. And so the crusade will eventually form being led by French and Italian nobles, and the Venetians will sign up to provide sea transport. So let's talk about the Venetians and where they came from, because I know I've mentioned them several times at this point. We haven't really looked into them 
at any kind of length. Venice's early history is not super well recorded, but from what we can tell what happened is that there were refugees in the 5th century fleeing the barbarian invasions, possibly the ones by Alaric um, in the early 5th century, and that they entered into the lagoons of northeast Italy. And a lagoon is basically like a swamp where in a place where it's not super hot, so it's not quite as nasty. So anyway, they set up the city of Venice there. And this city will be under Byzantine control until the 9th century, um, and this will be part of the Exarchate of Ravenna. Now, by the 11th century, Venice has been independent for a while. It's a republic system of government where they have an oligarchy where elites elect other elites to be their leader, known as a doge. Um, and by the 11th century, the Venetians were a strong commercial and naval power, and they have a small empire consisting of coastal towns and islands. Um, by the 12th century, the Venetians managed to extract a commercial clause from the Byzantines, starting with Alexius I, and they basically have control over all of Byzantine foreign trade. This leads to Venice and its various colonies becoming quite wealthy. Um, some people have argued that this ruined the Byzantine economy, but archaeology doesn't quite back that up. At any rate, they were depriving the Byzantines of potential wealth. In 1171, uh, the Byzantines retaliated finally, and the Emperor Manuel I actually uh, arrested all the Venetians and confiscated all their goods. This was made good, or at least someone promised to make it good. Andronicus uh, promised to make it up to the Venetians in the 1180s, but I'm not sure if he was ever he actually ruled long enough to do that. So there was now some bad blood between Venice and Byzantium. The Byzantines felt like they'd been exploited by these guys for a while and they had a general anti-Latin sentiment among the populace, whereas the Venetian uh, merchant class who ran the city of Venice you know, felt aggrieved still, and they felt like they couldn't trust the Byzantine authorities to honor their business contracts. So being a commercial power with a large navy, Venice always made sure that there was profit in any of their endeavors. So when they struck a deal with the Pope and with the noble leaders of the Crusade, the agreement was that the Venetians would transport about 33,000 crusaders who would pay a total of 85,000 silver marks. But in the event, only 12,000 men actually showed up. It helps when kings are actually a part of the crusade. They can recruit more men. And they only brought a total of 35,000 marks to pay for shipping. Now, rather than just using fewer ships and going with what they had, the Venetians, whose status as crusaders was a little bit unclear, um, I think that they had pledged to be on the campaign, but I don't think they had officially taken the vows. Or they had some, you know, ridiculous way of being part of it without being part of it. Anyway, um, so Doge Enrico Dandolo, pictured on your right, uh, who was already in his mid to late nineties by this point, decides to extract by threat, and he thinks that these guys are holding out on him, and basically forces them to send home for ransom money and to sell all their possessions aside from what they'll need to fight a crusade. And he gets another 14,000 silver marks. Well, that leaves these men still quite a bit short by about, you know, 35 or 36,000. So they eventually strike a deal where Dandolo will allow them to pay off their debt by basically fighting as mercenaries on behalf of the Venetian Empire, or Republic, I guess is the correct term. And he basically needs them to fight against um, rebellions and invasions that have occurred on the Adriatic coast of the Venetian uh, interest. So basically, in taking these cities, the Crusaders are now fighting against mostly other Christians, and a lot of them are um, backed up by the Hungarians, and of course Hungary is a Christian kingdom. Um, Innocent III is not happy about this, but he doesn't quite condemn it because, you know, he still thinks they're going to raise money and eventually go conquer something. So he's holding his peace for now, but he has expressed his displeasure at this agreement. Also, I was very heavily tempted to put a picture of the Grand Nagus from Greek, the, uh, Deep Space Nine rather than a picture of Doge Dandolo to represent him. But I didn't because I found an actual picture of Dandolo. Winter of 1202 found the Crusaders in the Adriatic on campaign, 
And on January 1st of 1203, they got an offer that they really couldn't refuse. And this came from a Byzantine prince who had been dispossessed. His name was Alexius Angelos, and he was the son of the deposed and blinded Isaac II. Um, Isaac had been replaced by his brother, also named Alexius, to make things more confusing, um, in, back in 1195. So, basically, the Crusaders are more or less on board for this from the get-go, because this is an easy opportunity to make some money. Alexius' offer is very generous, to say the least. So, he offers to pay off the debt of the Crusaders to the Venetians, and then give them an additional 100,000 silver marks. He also says that he will have the Byzantine church um, submit to the Pope, meaning breaking the schism, and having uh, the Byzantines practice Latin Mass and follow any theological differences, uh, or, you know, do away with any theological differences and follow what the Pope wants. And he also promises that he'll provide 10,000 Byzantine troops and Byzantine naval support for the attack on Egypt. Now, that last part about Byzantine naval support presumably was a joke because the Byzantine navy had really rotted at the uh, moors at this point, but the rest of it sounded really good. Um, and this, as I mentioned earlier, this expedition was already a little undermanned, so if you are a leader um, and you think you can get 10,000 extra troops, that would be a boon for sure. And this amount of money would also enable you to really fund a lot of things that you would need to get your project underway. So while this does look like a plain and simple money grab, if you are a crusade leader, you could justify this to yourself because you could use these resources to accomplish your mission. Now, a lot, some crusaders felt uneasy about it, and a minority of them actually just left for Syria and then signed up with the various armies of Outrimmer because um, they knew they didn't have enough manpower to launch an actual campaign. But the majority of the Crusaders stayed, and some of the leaders who did have doubts were successfully bribed by Dandolo, who really saw some opportunities for profit. Um, I guess he, he was you know, probably citing one of the Ferengi rules of acquisition at the time. And then Boniface of Montferrat, the titular leader of the Crusade, who was actually just a subordinate of Dandolo because of debt. All those guys were on board, and this was now a thing. So the Crusaders are going to set sail for um, Constantinople in April. So having set out for Constantinople in April, the Crusaders arrived in June, and their arrival was totally unexpected. No one was expecting to see Crusaders uh, pulling up into the Bosporus. So uh, what had been going on in Byzantium? Well, I talk about this in a lot more depth in my video on Byzantium from 1081 to 1204, but just as a very brief recap, what we'd seen over the last century in Byzantium was a general decline in central power and an increase in the power of the military aristocracy. But the previous two decades had really been the problem. Uh, the two Angloi leaders had been pretty much incompetent and ineffective, and none of the governors really ex respected their authority. So the emperors in Constantinople didn't have nearly as much authority as you would associate with the title emperor, and uh, they really didn't have a lot of resources at their disposal either. We also see that the corruption under the Angloi dynasty is pretty endemic. Um, now, there's an apocryphal but possibly truthy uh, a, a story which contains some truthiness even if it is apocryphal and that is that there was a Byzantine admiral who was so corrupt that he sold the nails from his ships for money because he didn't really have any intention of doing his job and he put his own personal profit ahead of his duty as an admiral so that just gives you an idea of how low people's estimation of their government had become by 1203 if you know anything about history or current events, then you know that regime change is a very risky proposition under any circumstances, especially when you have, say, faulty intelligence. So young Prince Alexius, while he's trying to upsell his um, bid for the throne to the Crusaders, said that he would be greeted as a liberator because the population was still outraged about his father being blinded and deposed by his uncle Alexius III. However, the population actually didn't really care. They didn't like any of the Angloi, and usually a fa a, an internal family coup was not really seen as usurpation 
because um, people were more loyal to families and dynasties than individuals. So no one really cared that much. Um, what they were concerned about, however, was this massive army of crusaders in their eyes barbarians who had arrived demanding money and you know trying to enter their city. So um, this meant that there was going to be a fight. Now there are some problems for both sides. The crusaders were not expecting a fight as I mentioned because they thought they'd be greeted as liberators and they thought that the population would be on their side. Now they have to gird themselves for the possibility of combat. For Alexius III, the uncle of you know the new prince Alexius, he only has about 20 galleys and about 15,000 troops in the capital. Um, as I said earlier, you know the Byzantine emperors have some limited power at this point, and the governors hold most of the real power. He does have 5,000 Varangian guardsmen who are very good, but his other 10,000 troops, some of them are more ceremonial, and they're not really that impressive. Um, because of poor communication, lack of early warning, and governors doing what they want, um, Alexius III cannot reasonably expect to be reinforced in any meaningful way during this conflict, so basically he will have to win with what he has on hand. And normally when you're the defender in a war, you can count on getting reinforcements in some way, but in this case, both sides have what they have. Um, another major disadvantage for Alexius is that the city of Constantinople had grown back to about half a million people, and if the city were successfully blockaded by land and sea, then he has a population of 500,000 people that he has to keep fed. And that is not a small task if you, you know, don't have access to the grain routes from the Black Sea. And again, like I said, his navy was pretty bad, and there are stories about some of his admirals selling off parts from ships. So, not a very effective navy either. And they're facing the Venetian fleet, uh, you know, to add even more to this um, and how bad the situation was. Now, um, so from June to July, the Crusaders will struggle and see some key positions and um, they'll have the positions that they would need to storm the city and at that point Alexius III flees and to avoid any further bloodshed Alexius's old officials decide to pull Isaac II out of a monastery and put a crown on his head and then they go to the Crusaders and say you won we all won Isaac is back yay so now things get a little bit awkward. So Isaac is back on the throne, but he had been blinded, so he's not actually able to rule. Um, so the pretext that the Crusaders have for avenging Isaac is now gone. So the one thing that they can do is then demand that Alexius IV also be a co-emperor since they were fighting with him. Uh, you know, the Byzantines are more than willing to grant that. After all, Isaac can't actually really govern on his own anymore. So Alexius IV is co-emperor, whatever, big deal. Um, the problem is the population of Constantinople was not privy to the agreement that Alexius had made with the Crusaders, and they damn sure weren't happy about it because they didn't sign up for it. If they had been allowed to vote on the issue, they would have voted against it, and they would have just stuck with Alexius III despite the fact that he was incompetent and corrupt. So um, when Alexius IV gets into the city and you know gets his crown off and goes into the treasury and is uh, you know trying to figure things out, he realizes that he's broke. And the only way that he's going to be able to raise anywhere near the amount of money that he needs is to start melting down icons and church treasures and ancient relics and all kinds of stuff. And he's able to raise about a hundred thousand silver marks, but his total debt is still more than that. So he then goes on campaign to hunt down his uncle, and maybe during the course of that campaign he'll come up with some booty or be able to you know, shake down a governor or something. But while he's away, there's a riot that breaks out as some crusaders visit the city, and they try to attack a Muslim mosque. And then there's, a, uh, there's actually a Muslim population in Constantinople by this time because it's a big trade hub. So anyway... Um, there's a local scuffle between you know the local Muslims and the other members of the city who are defending them and then the Crusaders and it ends up in a fire and this fire is so large that it uh, scorches enough of the city that a hundred thousand people are left homeless uh, that's pretty much the breaking point in this relationship now the Byzantines want 
to expel the Crusaders, and the Crusaders are done playing with the uh, Byzantines, and there's no respect or love lost on either side. The Byzantine Senate, which we very, very rarely hear about after um, it relocated to Constantinople in uh, the 4th century, uh, apparently still existed and had enough members that they wanted to elect a new emperor. They chose some guy, and then he refused and then went to a monastery and was trying to tell everybody who would listen that he is not the emperor and he has no interest in being the emperor. So now you have an outright division in the Byzantine state. On the one hand, you have Alexius IV and his crusader buddies. On the, on the other hand, you have the clergy who don't want to submit to Latin rites, the population as a whole, which is outraged about the fire, um, the nobles of Byzantium who are all military aristocrats and are eager to prove their mettle by beating the crusaders. So it's clear that Alexius IV is you know, someone with a limited uh, time on the throne left to him. And his father will die very late in 1203 or very early in 1204, one or the other. And uh, then Alexius will be sole ruler. Um, so from January to February, he's trying to keep everything in order and he's trying to, um, you know, make sure that he gets the Crusaders paid off and on their way. But uh, in February 1204, there's another riot and a nobleman named Alexius Dukas uh, who had become famous the previous summer for fighting the Crusaders, had emerged as the leading anti-Crusader, and he was declared emperor. And then in February, he deposed Alexius and had him strangled, and then ascended the throne himself as Alexius V. And his nickname was something like the Bushy Eyebrow or something like that. Anyway, um, this new emperor refused to honor Alexius IV's contract with the Crusaders. They had actually asked him, like, yeah, so we understand you took power, that's cool. We didn't really like Alexius all that much anyway. You're just as good. As long as you pay us what he promised, we're all fine and we can all go about our merry way. Um, Alexius V says, no, I did not agree to that contract. My people didn't agree to that contract. You need to leave. So he sends out messengers to request reinforcements from all the governors. And then he mans the walls and prepares for combat. When Pope Innocent III had originally heard of the scheme to put a new emperor on the Byzantine throne and get a bunch of money, he had reiterated his desire that they not fight other Christians, but for the most part, he had been pretty pliant and he hadn't said too much. After all, he had a crusade going on, and his main goal was to have crusades going on. Um, so when he hears that things have really taken a turn for the worst and that the Crusaders are actually trying to bust down the gates and take the city outright, he decides to uh, write a much more strongly worded letter where he tells them to cease and desist. The Latin clergy in the Crusade actually receive this letter, but they decide to hide it because they're on the verge of taking the greatest city in the Christian world. So on April 9th, 1204, the Crusaders make an assault attempt, but bad weather and Byzantine resistance managed to throw back an assault by land and sea. So, um, for whatever reason, despite the fact that the Crusaders had won, I mean, lost, excuse me, um, Alexius V chose this time uh, to disappear. And he flees, and uh, now there's no emperor in Constantinople, and they're not able to choose one in the next few days. So on April 12, 1204, the weather's cleared, and the Crusaders attack again. The Byzantines are basically leaderless, so once the uh, wall, once little holes start opening in the walls and people start pouring in, there's no one to lead. Um, for a while, it was still possible to drive out the small number of Crusaders who had entered the city, but the Varangians refused the counterattack until they were given a sufficient raise. And then eventually, um, they go up and offer their services to the Latin lords of the crusade because they figure that these guys have more money. Um, again, the Varangian Guard really has a great reputation for the most part, but this is the big stain on it. Um, and it reminds everyone that these guys were simply mercenaries. Um, in the ensuing aftermath of the uh, fall of Constantinople, there's a three-day sack. Um, many ancient artifacts are looted or destroyed. And um, many of them actually end up in Venice because the Venetians have a bunch of ships nearby. And actually the famous lion statues of Venice came from Constantinople and they were taken during this sack. With Constantinople out of the way, the 
Crusaders decided to write a document which would legally divide the empire among themselves. This is called the Partitio Terrarum Imperii Romaniae, the partition of the lands of Romania. And what this was, was dividing this land into areas ruled by various Crusader nobles. So you have the Latin Empire, which is sort of the main state that they found, centered on Constantinople, the Kingdom of Thessalonica, guessed around, uh, based around, you guessed it, Thessalonica, Duchy of Athens, based around, shocker, Athens, the Principality of Achaea, uh, there actually is an area called Achaea in the Peloponnese, so, but it probably wasn't named after that, it's probably more of a classical reference, the Duchy of the Archipelago, this is um, named after the islands uh, in the Aegean, and then the Venetians took a bunch of stuff too, like Crete and Rhodes and Euboea and Corfu and some other stuff. But as you see here, not everything went to the Crusaders. There were three Byzantine splinter states which emerged as well. The Empire of the Trebizond under the Comnenoi, the Empire of Nicaea, and the Despotate of Epirus. So from about 1204 to 1261, that is called the Latin period of Byzantine history. Um, there are still Latin states around, but over the course of that period, we'll see that the Byzantines are slowly but surely reconquering their own lands from the Crusaders. So let's look at the results and legacy of the Fourth Crusade. Um, first off, because of the Fourth Crusade getting so badly diverted to Constantinople, most of the Crusaders did not end up reaching their objective, and only a handful ended up entering service in the Middle East. Most of them either remained in the Latin Empire or they went home to Europe. Um, because of the nature of this failure and because the attack on Egypt had not been tried and it was something that held out some promise, um, two crusades would be launched into Egypt during the 13th century, the 5th and the 7th, but both of those would fail. Um, now if we go back to the early 13th century and the 4th um, Crusade, we see that Greek Christians feel grievously betrayed by their Western brethren, and while that relationship had been tense for a while, um, this really broke it wide open. And while there hadn't really been a lot of hard feeling um, between the common people of each church, uh, this really sort of poured salt on the wound of the schism, and it would make it pretty impossible for the two sides to ever really have any chance of reconciliation. Um, Byzantium itself will never fully recover. Now, the Byzantine successor states will manage to drive out the Latins in due time, but they will never be anything like what they were even during the time of the Angeloi. Um, and because Byzantium will be in such a weakened state and will be, um, you know, under predation from the Venetians and other Italian city-states during the remainder of its lifetime, it will be completely unable to stop the spread of the Ottoman Sultanate and it also won't be able to do anything about the rise of countries like Bulgaria and Serbia. So the Fourth Crusade does have a major impact on the history of Eastern Europe, and you could actually make a case that it has the most direct um, impact on later history as compared to other Crusades simply because of uh, there being one power which was clearly ruined by it, and then three powers which were enabled by it in the long run. So, I would make that argument about the Fourth Crusade at any rate. Anyway, um, surprisingly it did not ruin the um, Crusader mentality. As I mentioned, there were at least three more major Crusades. There were Crusades in the Baltic still. There was the Albigensian Crusade. Um, there are Crusades in Eastern Europe against the Ottomans in the 15th century. So, you know, this doesn't ruin crusading, but it definitely puts a big dent in its overall legacy and legitimacy, for sure.